My name is Mark Johnson. I'm an infectious doctor here at Confluence Health. Uh, it is the 19th of March, and this is our every other week um, COVID-19 Q&A session. Um, I have a, a few questions that folks have sent in in advance, um, and then I'll be watching the chat as it comes through to see if there's any other questions that come up as we go. I think I wanted to start by taking a moment um, to think about the uh, almost 80 people who have passed away in our hospital over the last year due to COVID-19. Um, that number would have been a lot higher if it hadn't been from incredible medical care throughout the entirety of their stay in our hospital. Um, from the time they arrived in emergency room uh, to the time that our discharge coordinators helped get them out the door. And uh, I am just in awe of the work that folks have done in order to save so many lives from this uh, terrible pandemic. Um, it was over a year ago now, on the 11th of March 2020, that the World Health Organization declared this a pandemic. And I'm not going to quote you all the numbers um, because we've heard those before. Um, but I wanted to take a moment um, to kind of put things in context a little bit. Um, I don't know what your experience, particularly in the pandemic, has been. I think it's touched all of us in very profound ways. Um, and I think about um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines and how this is an incredible time for optimism. I think that's where we should start, is that this is a moment in a pandemic when I think we can really start to be optimistic. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But that optimism is born from uh, declining case counts, which we expected to see as we came out of the winter months. And it's very likely that we will see manageable numbers of COVID-19 hospitalizations over the next six months or so. Um, in the upper single digit or in the low teens if things go well. And that's incumbent upon people to continue to wear a mask in public spaces um, and to um, uh, hopefully the, the, the vaccine rollout continues to move along in earnest. And so I'm, I'm really optimistic and I think we have to acknowledge that, that um, for quite some time we've heard folks in public health um, and it's been all uh, negative. And there's a reason for that, because we didn't have a lot of good news. Uh, but we're starting to get good news now. And, and I think there's a real time for optimism. But I would also say that our work is not done yet. Um, national case counts declined by five or six fold versus two months ago. And that is a huge benefit. That is a huge win. But we're still at 50 to 60,000 cases nationally a day. And until we start to get closer to um, less than 5,000 uh, lab confirmed COVID-19 cases across the United States per day, then I don't think we have this thing beat. Uh, I think we have a chance, uh, but I think there's some potential things that could make it more difficult. Um, so with that, we will get started. Again, uh, real optimism um, that I think we should be all aware of. The first thing I wanted to do um, was talk about the status of the um, vaccines. And so for a moment, I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Um, uh, so hopefully you all can see this. Um, but this shows um, in a uh, couple different populations who has been fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated meaning it's uh, two weeks since their second dose of vaccine. Um, some of these data are a little bit older, so the list from Confluence Health Physicians from the 15th of February um, and the more up-to-date things for all Confluence Health employees. And so as we look at these numbers, it should tell us a couple things. Um, number one, I'm really um, uh, pleasantly um, and appropriately, um, we're seeing really high numbers of vaccine uptake amongst our Confluence Health physicians. Um, this data is old and this number is a little bit higher now. Um, and I would like to see that 
uh, across the board that vaccine rates amongst all Confluence Health employees at all of our sites uh, continue to improve. Um, and I want to make sure that people have a lot of confidence in these vaccines as well I think they should, but I want to make sure that people are having their questions answered that they can get their vaccine with confidence. But what I think is also important to note is that Washington State um, is a bit above the national average for fully vaccinated. And so there's more than 900,000 people in the state who are fully vaccinated now, which is incredible. Um, and there's been more than 2 million doses of vaccine administered in the state. Um, and um, there's um, uh, continued work in all the four counties that we serve. Um, and it's great to see, I mean, Chelan County at 18% fully vaccinated. Um, and that doesn't count those folks who have just received their first dose of vaccine. So this is incredible progress, I think. Um, so this kind of sets the stage for the rest of our discussion. Um, and then I look at these data and say, well, you know, I heard the other day that uh, University of Washington Medical Center with their 19,000 some employees, um, they have about 70% of their employees across the board vaccinated. Um, I think that number may not include all of their completely remote um, workers at this point, um, but it's still something to shoot for. I, th I think we can beat University of Washington. I know we can. Um, so I just wanted to share these data for a second before we kind of launch into some of the questions. So I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen now. And hopefully you can see my face again. Um, so um, a couple questions that that came up um, that I think we can address here. Um, so first, um, one of the questions that came up today was, um, I heard today uh, that the CDC on the 19th of March um, said something about we're moving from six feet to three feet. Um, does that apply for everywhere? And the answer to that is no, it does not. Um, so in public, um, in healthcare settings, et cetera, it's still six feet with a mask. That's what social distancing means. But what they said today was based on some new data, in part from a uh, cohort study they did at some schools in Massachusetts, and then also some additional data the CDC is yet to publish. Um, they said that um, elementary students wearing a well-fitting mask that are in their classroom, um, now at three feet is the minimum distance of separation from physical distance. Um, they have also said that this now also applies to students in middle school and high school, um, as long as community transmission is not high. Uh, but they also went on to say that adults in the school, for instance, teachers still need to maintain six feet of distance between themselves and other persons, including adults and, and students. And then the six foot rule still applies for all students when they're in common areas. Um, so lobbies, uh, auditoriums, that kind of thing. Um, and then they also went on to say that activities that require more exhalation, um, uh, physical fitness class, uh, sports, uh, singing, these are things that should be done either outdoors or in a very well ventilated space. Uh, so again, none of these three foot guidance applies to the community at large, nor does it apply to um, healthcare settings. So this is very particular guidance for schools, specifically for the students themselves when they're in their classroom. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, let's see here. So other questions um, that have come across recently. Um, I had COVID, uh, not me, this is the questioner. I had COVID in late November. I'm assuming that my own body mounted a robust response to fight the virus and developed immunity over that three plus week period that I was exposed and had symptoms. Um, so. Why is my natural immunity not the same or as good as vaccine immunity? This is an excellent question, whoever asked it. Um, the question again is, um, 
is vaccine induced immunity better than immunity get after infection? And the answer, unfortunately, is it depends. Um, we know that the immune response after infection can be quite variable. Um, only about 20% of people who are infected with COVID-19 don't develop detectable antibodies in the blood. We usually don't check antibodies because it's not clinically helpful though in, in almost all cases. Um, but the vast majority of people get infected mount some immune response that is um, includes antibody response and then a cell mediated immune response, including robust generation, hopefully of memory uh, T cells. And we know from other um, coronaviruses, for instance, the four coronaviruses that, pre that previously circulated uh, amongst us that caused the common cold, um, that that degree of immunity was maybe nine to 12 months before it, it waned away for that particular strain. Um, but the, the um, difference here is that um, our immune system from person to person would be quite variable. And it also appears that um, immune response probably is less robust after infection if you had milder disease. If you were in the hospital, critically ill, um, nearly dead from COVID and then recovered, you probably develop a more robust immune response than somebody who had milder symptoms. Um, and the duration of immunity after in fact, natural infection with SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease um, still is being determined. Um, we do not have what I call a clinical correlate of protection, meaning I don't have a antibody test that tells me you are definitely immune, but we do use what's called neutralizing antibodies in the clinical studies in the early phases of the, the vaccine clinical trials to ensure that at least at a minimum, our immune system generates a robust antibody response to vaccine. And those dose ranging studies identified that um, the antibody response to the vaccine, especially after you've gotten the second dose of vaccine, is much greater than the antibody response that almost everybody gets from natural infection. So first of all, the vaccine does generate a much more robust um, antibody immune response. And that's probably why the vaccine is so reactogenic. It's a good vaccine. And so that's why when we get vaccinated, a lot of us will have two days of fevers and injection site reaction because our immune system is responding so well to this vaccine challenge. So the antibody response after vaccination is greater than it is after almost all instances of naturally acquired infection. Um, we don't yet know how long the vaccines are effective for, um, but the early um, immunologic profiles of individuals who are vaccinated, including the proportion of uh, memory um, T cells that are generated uh, would predict that if the um, viral variants don't start to demonstrate vaccine escape or that the vaccines are still effective in a general sense, it's possible these vaccines would be effective for uh, at least a year, but maybe even two or three years. So the vaccine provides a probably a longer period of immunity. We don't know this yet. Um, that's what the immunologic preliminary testing suggests, but that's still under study. So um, the, short, the, the answer to the question again is um, probably you develop an immune response after vaccine. The likelihood of reinfection, as we've heard, within three months after infection is very, very low. In other words, after you're infected, over three months time, you're very unlikely to get reinfected. After that time, the likelihood of reinfection starts to increase. Um, so uh, that is the exact reason why even if you've been infected, we still recommend you get vaccinated. Um, and when vaccine supply is short, we say, well, you could defer your vaccine until three months after you, your infection. But in fact, you can and probably still should get vaccinated as soon as you're feeling generally better from your infection. And once you're out of the isolation period, meaning you're no longer infectious to others, which for most people is about 10 days. So hopefully that answered um, that question. Um, it, it, um, I did not mention variants, and we'll talk about variants more, but the variants do um, mean something as well. I'm gonna go back to my screen share for a moment if I can. I hope I can.
So, um, the data that comes out in COVID-19 comes pretty fast and furious. So, um, this was from a few weeks ago showing that um, on the left side of the screen, even the variant, the D614G, which is the most, is the widely circulating COVID-19 variant since April of 2020, um, that's kind of the, the baseline standard we're looking at for them here. This is the Moderna vaccine. So when they looked on the left side of the screen at the, the UK variant of the B117 version, they still had a pretty um, uh, good antibody response. There wasn't much drop off at all. On the right side of the screen, you can see with the South African variant, the B1351 um, uh, variant of concern, there was a significant drop off by about an order of magnitude of the antibody response. But the good news is, as I've said already, the vaccine generates such a profound antibody response that I'm not concerned just at this moment about the variants. But this study was published uh, today at 1.38 p.m. So <laughs> this is hot off the press. And they looked at individuals um, in the middle of the screen who had recovered from SARS-CoV-2 infection, and on the right side of the screen, those who had gotten the vaccine. And what they found is they were looking at neutralizing antibody titers. So again, neutralizing antibody, those are the things that um, bind to the spike protein and um, neutralize the virus. This is not yet, as I said, a true clinical court of protection, but it's the best we have. And so these neutralizing antibody tests are done in a biosafety level three lab where people wear the space suits because they're using live coronavirus. So what we can see is on the right side of the screen that it was about an order of magnitude greater um, neutralizing antibody titer for the vaccinated folks versus people who had recovered from SARS-CoV-2 uh, with different types of variants. So the B117 or UK variant, um, and then that uh, they also list the N501Y mutation, which is one of the mutations seen in B117. So these, this is a very small group that was being looked at. The CDC has similar data, um, but it just shows us again that at this moment, um, we're still getting, for, for some of the uh, viral variants, we're still getting a very robust neutralizing antibody response. So um, that was a long answer to question one, but I think it was an important one. Um, there was another question here. What role does the current food system and animal agriculture play in zoonotic diseases and pandemics? The answer is, this is a big one. Um, so it's increasingly coming clear uh, from data from last week that um, probably the most um, important animal reservoir that uh, triggered this infection were uh, bamboo rats in live markets in southwestern China. So there's been a lot of discussion about this. And we know for coronaviruses in particular, um, recombination occurs in, um, in animals, and that's what we mean by it's a zoonotic disease. Um, so it does play a big role. Um, pandemics are an ongoing issue. Um, zoonotic viral infections happen all the time. Um, you might be surprised to know that in southwestern Guinea in Africa, and in rural DRC, the Congo in Africa, there are currently outbreaks of Ebola. Um, so they are very aggressively doing ring vaccination campaigns with an Ebola vaccine that is approved that uses the same adenovirus 26 vector platform that um, they subsequently have used now for the Johnson & Johnson um, COVID-19 vaccine. So it's great to see science at work showing that zoonotic diseases are with us. They're always going to happen and we have to do our best to be prepared for them. Okay, um, another question. Um, if you have already had COVID-19, how long do antibodies stay in your system before needing the vaccine? Um, I'll kind of piggyback on the, the first question. Um, and the short answer is again, the antibodies themselves don't tell the whole story about um, whether you have um, protection for reinfection. So the best is, I would say is again, if you've been infected with COVID-19, it's very unlikely for you to get reinfected over the next three months, not impossible. Um, but uh, but after that, I would for sure recommend getting vaccinated 
uh, to reduce your chance of getting infected. Uh, people ask all the time, well, you know, again, I got infected. Why do I need a vaccine? It's that reason I just said. I want you to get vaccinated to against COVID-19, even though you've already had it, because I don't want you to get it again. And the vaccines um, that we have now are providing um, protection, at least to some degree, against the variants that are in existence. Um, we know that, um, for instance, in Manaus, Brazil, a town in the northwestern part of Brazil in the Amazon, um, that at one point in the pandemic months ago, they thought that perhaps about um, 60 percent of the population or more had been infected and so they felt like they had naturally acquired herd immunity um, but now the p1 strain um, the so-called brazilian strain has run rampant through their city and they've run out of oxygen and they are having uh, catastrophic failures of the healthcare system because they're being overrun again so the variants are an issue and reinfection with a variant when you've recovered from a different strain of the virus um, is a real issue. So um, we don't know how long antibodies, how long we have protective immunity after infection, but within the first three months, it's pretty low. But again, variants might change that. Um, we know that the detectable antibodies in the blood tend to drop off around that period of time as well. But again, antibodies don't tell the whole story of our immune response. Um, to the vaccine, which includes a robust cell-mediated immunity, which includes not only, the, again, the production of the antibodies, but also that memory T-cell response that allows us to have long-term immune protection from this virus. Okay, uh, next question. Um, I have been vaccinated, but have a lot of people in my life who are staunchly against receiving the vaccine. Um, one of the biggest arguments I continue to hear is that mRNA vaccine science has been around for uh, a long time, but has never been deemed ready for use before now, or study for any sort of long-term health impacts. Uh, I have a lot of friends and acquaintances, acquaintances who believe that receiving the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine is effectively signing up to participate in a clinical study for something that no one in the scientific or medical community has yet put through a long-term study to confirm safety and long-term lack of negative health impacts particularly for those who are not in an at-risk age bracket and don't have underlying conditions. This is not an attractive proposition at all. Uh, so this is a, a complicated issue. I think it gets into the idea of um, being hesitant about getting the vaccine because um, folks are just not convinced that there's enough personal benefit to them to outweigh the risk or um, maybe vaccine indifference, the idea that um, an individual might feel like this isn't really their pandemic because they're in an age group that uh, is at much lower risk of severe illness. Um, or, you know, there's some people who might have, um, might have an attitude that they want to get vaccinated. They still have some questions, but they're just finding it hard to get vaccinated. You know, I think even when you're eligible through the vaccine prioritization uh, phases, they come out. Some folks are just um, not as adept at um, re responding to, uh, for instance, the Department of Health text messages or um, utilizing the, the Internet to get themselves registered. Um, they're having a hard time with the phone line. So there's lots of barriers here. But I wanted to address this question as best I can because it's complicated. Um, the first thing I'd say is that uh, these mRNA vaccines have been studied for a long period of time. Uh, we just haven't had one in clinical use yet. And that's largely because there just wasn't a pressure to get it out um, as of yet. So um, uh, mRNA vaccines first started to be looked at in the 1990s. Um, and so uh, for more than a decade, we've had several mRNA vaccine candidates in clinical studies. Uh, there's one for CMV or cytomegalovirus, um, Zika virus, uh, influenza, uh, rabies, uh, just to name a few. And so in those phase one or phase two studies, um, which included safety studies and then dose ranging, uh, we have a lot of data there for safety. Um, but initially early on, there was still the problem with these mRNA vaccines of ensuring that the mRNA, which is so fragile, was able to get into um, the, the muscle cell in the shoulder and get into that lymph node to generate a good immune response because the mRNA would fall apart. 
And so that's why over time they were able to develop these uh, lipo nanoparticles, these lipid coats that would protect the mRNA long enough to trigger this nice immune response. Um, and then that mRNA just gets degraded by our normal cell um, enzymes. So um, that piece of the technology, that is newer, um, but that was a critical part to the development of these vaccines. And then of course, with any vaccine, we want to make sure that we're generating the right immunologic profile. The immune system is very complicated and it's an incredible machine that we have. Um, and so what they found is when they first started to try to make a vaccine against the SARS-CoV-1 virus back in 2003, before that um, brief pandemic or that brief epidemic petered out, um, the vaccine they were um, developing had a tendency to induce in the uh, preclinical studies to induce more of a Th2 mediated immune response. Um, this is kind of a complicated topic, but it just that was not desired. People tended to have a lot of side effects um, and the vaccine didn't work as well. And so over the intervening decade or so, they were able to make sure that the vaccines using mRNA technology were pushing a Th1 mediated immune response. And that's what we see today. And that's proven by the immunologic profiles of the, these vaccines when they looked at it in the phase one and phase two um, dose ranging studies. So um, these vaccines have been around for a while, but I guess I, I, you know, people could still say, well, these vaccines have only been out for a few months. Well, that's technically true that um, these two mRNA vaccines were given FDA authorization um, on around December 10th and December 18th, respectively, for the Pfizer Moderna vaccines. So you'd say, well, we only have three and a half months of, uh, of data in these, but that's not entirely true because the massive phase three clinical trials for these vaccines they started enrolling both of them on the 27th of July. So really at this point, we have about nine months of safety data. But what's important is in the clinical trials, uh, we, we use the benchmark of we wanna see two months of safety data. That's the real critical thing. And why is that? Because in over 70 years of vaccine science, if we're gonna see a severe side effect from vaccine, they all happen. And I mean all of them within six weeks of the vaccine. And so that's why the safety data for the big phase three clinical trials were initially saying we got to at least have two months safety data before authorization can be granted. Now, admittedly, when a vaccine moves out from um, a small group of a relatively small group of clinical trial of 40,000 people out to now vaccinating, there's been over 100 million doses given the United States so far and more than 300 million worldwide. We still want to see other new safety signals that are happening. And that's why the CDC through their data safety data link either VAERS or VSAFE are looking very closely at this. And while we're seeing um, reactogenicity um, because of the normal immune response to the vaccine right off the bat, um, we are not seeing any other concerning safety signals. You know, so for instance, um, in the clinical studies between both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, in the clinical trials, seven people um, developed Bell's palsy. Whether it was because of the vaccine or not, it's hard to tell. Um, but um, since that time, we are not seeing um, significant cases of Bell's palsy. And in fact, the rates of Bell's palsy, that um, neurologic uh, syndrome, is actually lower in people who've been vaccinated with one of these mRNA vaccines than it is in the general population. So if anything, you would say, well, by that logic, this vaccine is protective against that. Now, I wouldn't say that. I'm just using that same logic. Um, it's very difficult to ascertain a causal relationship between a vaccine and an event. And so anytime we see event, we wanna look closely. That's why with the AstraZeneca vaccine, there was a, uh, a hold by a few countries in Europe over the last week, because they were concerned that 27 people out of um, 17 million vaccine doses developed uh, blood clots. Um, well, it turns out that the rate of blood clots were being seen in these uh, vaccinated individuals was less than the baseline rate of blood clots. So it's something that has to be looked at, uh, but this time the data is not concerning. Um, these vaccines are very good at protecting you from severe COVID-19 disease, but they, um, they do not uh, protect you against uh, everything else. Um, and life will happen around us. So just because we get a vaccine doesn't mean other things can't happen. You know, we could get a vaccine and 
surreptitiously have a motor vehicle accident a few days later. And that doesn't mean the vaccine caused it, but you know, when we see other uh, medical events occur, we, we look closely at it and the CDC is doing that. But the safety signals so far are very reassuring. We always um, watch closely when vaccines move from clinical study of 30 or 40,000 people out to millions. Once we get past 3 million doses of vaccine though, we start to saw, uh, breathe a sigh of relief because that's enough data to say, ah, we feel a lot better about this. Um, so, you know, the question really is, well, could these vaccines have some sort of long-term um, consequences? And my glib response is the long-term consequences that these vaccines are gonna really reduce your chance of getting a severe COVID-19 and dying. That's the long-term consequence. Um, the other things of, you know, could these vaccines have some sort of hidden latent long-term side effects, um, that um, there's just not a biologic plausibility based on what I said, 70 years of vaccine science, um, uh, a couple decades of mRNA vaccine development, um, and then uh, early phase one and phase two clinical trials of these mRNA vaccine platforms. Um, and now the safety data we have so far with these specific mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. So I, I think, you know, this is a complicated thing to unpack. And I, um, you know, when I think about <clears throat> at this moment, 57% of our healthcare workers across the enterprise have been vaccinated. Again, that might include some folks who are working completely remotely at home. Um, but that tells me people still have questions. And I want to try to help people with answers because it's important to me that um, we end this pandemic and vaccines are the way to do it. But it's also important to me that you feel comfortable with the vaccine that you're getting that's going to provide you protection against getting severe COVID-19 disease or hospitalization. But it's also vaccines provide such a profound benefit outside of ourselves. I appreciate that vaccines are interesting if, if we try to think of it as a medical therapy. Um, most medical therapies are designed to treat a disease, but with vaccines, we're, we're telling somebody who um, otherwise is generally healthy, um, and we're saying, we're giving you this thing to prevent something you don't have. And that is a, um, that that is exactly why vaccines are so closely studied and so regulated. And so the profound amount of review, review and scrutiny these vaccines have gone through, I think should provide all of us some relief and confidence that these are good vaccines. These are incredibly effective vaccines, far and away better than we could have even hoped. Um, but the, also the safety data is very reassuring. Nothing's without risk. And I think we have to appreciate that. Um, I also, you know, when I think about our healthcare workers, and I think about um, especially our frontline providers who are uh, doing the hard work day in and day out, seeing these critically sick patients. I can't imagine what they're going through. Um, I see, and I see a lot of co sick COVID patients in the hospital. And I've provided medical care myself for over 500 COVID-19 patients in the hospital. But, um, when I go evaluate a patient, I do my evaluation and I um, see the patient for the period of time I need to see them and move on. But I'm not the nurse or the respiratory tech or the CNA who's in the patient's room for extended periods of time, who these patients are lonely, they're scared, their family can't visit them. Um, these healthcare providers are holding hands and comforting these people at just such a vulnerable time in their lives as they're suffering from this terrible disease. And so when I think about our frontline medical workers, you know, what has gone right for them over the last year? The answer is not too much. You know, it's been a terrible year. Um, so I think a lot of our folks who are have been intimately involved in pro providing care for these patients, a lot of them have gotten vaccinated. Um, but I would just urge folks to, if you still have questions, and you're trying to build up your vaccine confidence so you feel comfortable getting this vaccine because I'm telling you it's the right thing to do to protect yourself and protect others, then please reach out. And that's what these are designed for. Okay.
Uh, we're getting close to the end here, so I'm going to try to finish up with a few other questions, and then I'll check the chat just to make sure if anyone's putting questions in that I answer them. Um, so let's see. Um, oh, here's a question. Can I get a vaccine if I am pregnant? And the answer there is... I'm doing a recording. If you step in front of the camera, you'll be in the recording. He's okay. This pandemic's been tough for all of us. Um, my eight-year-old just came in the room and he's trying to tell me that our toddler is just not going down for the nap like we had hoped. <laughs> um, can I just have five more minutes? Thanks. Um, so can I get a vaccine if I'm pregnant? Um, you know, initially these were not well studied in pregnant women because that was generally an ex exclusion criteria, um, but there were um, several patients um, numbering a little less than 100, I think, in the clinical trials initially who became pregnant while they were on the clinical study and had been vaccinated. Um, and there was no concerning safety data amongst that group. Um, since that time, um, because it is still recommended that after a discussion of risk benefits and alternatives with a provider, we still would recommend that pregnant women get vaccinated because the risk of complications of COVID-19 disease and infection far outweigh the potential theoretical risk of complications of vaccination. We were saying we would recommend the vaccine in a general sense. Uh, that being said, um, now we have data. So as of the 2nd of February, more than 10,000 um, individuals who were pregnant received the vaccine. And there's not a concerning safety signal other than the normal reactogenicity that people get with the vaccine. Um, of course, uh, first trimester um, miscarriages are a common phenomenon uh, all the time. So, you know, I think um, the, the rates are pretty significant and I think everyone kind of underappreciates that. And so the rates of first trimester miscarriages in vaccine recipients um, was no higher than the baseline rate in the population. Um, so that's not a concern there. So we're not seeing a concerning safety signal. So I would still say that folks who are pregnant, I mean, in a general sense, I would still recommend vaccine. Um, immunocompromised individuals, we have uh, less data about efficacy in that group. Um, these vaccines are so immunogenetic, meaning they have such a good immune response that we think that there's probably some degree of protection. We just don't know how much but we're not concerned about safety issues in immunocompromised persons because these are not live viral vaccines. Um, we are at Confluence Health monitoring closely for individuals who have been fully vaccinated and then subsequently developed COVID. Um, we have now had um, in a few immune compromised folks, um, we have had a few individuals who were not quite fully vaccinated, meaning two weeks after the second dose of vaccine, but then developed COVID. Uh, one was a solid organ transplant recipient, um, and they developed COVID uh, a few days after the second dose of vaccine, after a high-risk exposure where they visited extended family. Um, and then um, another one was a patient actively on chemotherapy um, who was a few days after their second dose of vaccine and developed COVID. Both of these were mild disease though, and so uh, that's kind of reassuring, but we're looking at this closely. We'd still anticipate that some people are going to get COVID after the vaccine because the vaccines are not 100% effective. They are very good, but they're not 100% effective. But we're still looking for that red line in the sand. If we start to see a lot of people being admitted to hospital with severe COVID despite being fully vaccinated, that's when we start worried, getting worried that the variants are playing a bigger role um, and we need to be prepared for that. But at this time, um, there's not uh, a lot of people getting vaccinated or end up getting lab confirmed COVID, but we're gonna monitor for that because I think it's critically important. Um, there's a question here, um, based on what you know now, do you think we will all need another vaccine this fall, similar to annual flu vaccines? And the answer is it depends on us, because if we get uh, viral case counts low enough and there's not a lot of virus transmitting in the community, then the variants shouldn't be that big of an issue. Um, I think we all have to be pessimists to some degree and say, we've got to be prepared that 
if that were to happen and we need to get a booster dose of vaccine in the fall or the winter, that we're ready for that. So the um, vaccine companies are already working on that so that if the vaccine, if the viruses do exhibit vaccine escape, meaning the vaccine isn't effective anymore because the virus mutated so much down the road, then they'll be prepared with booster doses. Um, you know, this the virus, they normally mutate. It's what viruses do. And um, they can't, uh, the, the likelihood of um, significant numbers of mutations occurring that might cause vaccine escape, that risk really is mitigated if the case counts in our community are lower. And the case counts in our community are lower right now. And we're seeing it in the hospital and we're seeing it in a lab testing site, but they're not necessarily what we want them to be just yet. So that's why I tell people keep masking and get that vaccine because now's the time. This next three months in our response is so critical. If we do this right, we can beat this virus, but we've got to do it right. And that's just still being safe, still masking, still trying to not do any unnecessary travel, especially on airplanes. Um, and getting that vaccine. We know the case counts are going lower now because we're coming out of winter time. And I've discussed that before why we, we knew that was gonna happen. But the other thing is the vaccine, right now the case counts are also low probably because of some degree of immunity in people recovered from COVID. And so they have that transient immunity, at least for the short term, and then also vaccine rates. And you'd say, well, only 12% of Washington state is fully vaccinated, but that's a huge start. If we were to estimate that um, about 25% of the population um, has been infected with COVID-19 recently, and so they have some trans immunity, and about 10 or 12% of us are fully vaccinated, that means at this moment, we've got about a 35% community protection rate. And if we were to compare this virus to another virus with another R0 or transmission level, like polio. So polio, uh, more than 50 years ago, when that vaccine campaign went out, when they had um, immune protection rates of at least 30 to 35 percent of the community, they saw case counts come down. And so that's what we're seeing now. So we've got to, you know, if we can continue to get people vaccinated and rapidly over the next two months, get a lot of us vaccinated, we're going to see this get better. It's not that we hit a threshold of number vaccinated and then all of a sudden everything is perfect. It's a graded response, and we're seeing the benefit of that now. We're seeing an early downtrend in case counts. We're seeing a benefit. We just got to keep this momentum going. So theoretically possible that we might need a booster dose of vaccine in the fall. Uh, we don't know that yet. It depends on our decisions now. If we can get enough of us vaccinated and keep getting the case counts lower, 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 with less than 5,000 case counts nationally per day, then I don't think we're going to need that, but maybe. Um, so we're at 4.15, and I said this is a 45-minute thing, and so I want to cut it off now. Um, hopefully this was helpful, but I wanted to end with a brief statement. Um, so uh, Tom Frieden, who is the head of the CDC um, uh, eight or ten years ago, he recently said he wanted to share five facts about the vaccine. And so I want to share those now. And if you want to use these to try to be good vaccine ambassadors to encourage friends and family to get vaccinated when they're eligible, please do it. So number one, if you get infected with this virus, it will go all over your body. It will stay there for about a week. It could cause you to get very ill for the short term. It could even cause you to die. And it's possible to perhaps even likely that you will have long-term effects, including lingering symptoms for months. The risk of all these things happening after infection far outweighs any potential risk from the vaccine. Number two, if you get the vaccine, it's gonna prime your immune system, but then the vaccine components are gone. They're out of your body. They will not be with you anymore. Number three, nationally, more than 95% of doctors have gotten the COVID-19 vaccine. And they got it just as fast as they could. And I think that should tell us something. Number four, the more we vaccinate, the faster we can all get back to growing our economy, getting people back to their jobs, and getting back to some semblance of normal. In the meantime, masks give us some degree of freedom 
and the vaccine is going to help us get us pandemic. Number five, if we get a lot of people vaccinated over the next few months, we are going to save at minimum 100,000 American lives that otherwise will be lost to COVID, but also getting us out of this pandemic. So the final thing is vaccines, along with other risk mitigation, in particular, continue to wear our masks, is our way out of this pandemic. So I will stop there. Um, we'll do this again in another two weeks. I hope this was helpful. Um, in the meantime, if you have any other questions or concerns, um, please pass them along through the normal channels and we'll queue them up for the next Q&A. Thanks so much for your time. Um, if you can't see my shirt, uh, hopefully you can see there that uh, peace, love, and a vaccine. Please get vaccinated. If you have questions that help boost your vaccine confidence, please reach out. Have a great day. Thank you.